Hallelujah. When Sister Carneal mentioned about it wouldn't hurt us just to be in the church for seven days and nights, I remembered Brother Matson Bose, a great man of God from the Chicago area. He was a Swede, and um, he had one of the simplest faith messages. In fact, when the revival broke down in Africa, and Brother uh, uh, God used Brother Tommy Osborne to go down and have that great meeting down in Africa, uh, they had so many people saved, and um, there was such a move of the Spirit, they raised up something like a thousand churches in one year in Kenya alone and another thousand in Uganda developed at that time what they call the faith clinics. And they would send, um, Brother Matson Bose would go down, he was an older man, would go down and do two weeks all day long of teaching the preachers faith clinics. They didn't teach them everything. You know, there are a lot of uh, esoteric things in the scripture. And I find a lot of people get saved and they major on the esoterics and they minor on the things that God wants to put in their lives to be effective for him. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that if you have that, the, that extra time, you'd like to get in there and do a word study on, you know, the flowers and the Bible and the numbers and the, you know, all the esoterics. But they had to train pastors quickly. And they taught them how to lay hands on the sick, <laughs> how to cast out devils, how to get their faith operative, how to go out into the village and give the basic message. And these faith clinics were powerful. Two weeks, every six months, he'd go back. And he'd, that, was, that was all the Bible school those African brothers got. But it was dynamic. Some of the greatest preachers in the world are from you. The greatest pastors and men of God are from Uganda and, and, uh, and from African nations where they have had been thrust right into the ministry like that. But brother, I said all that to say that brother Matson Bose locked himself up in his church up in Chicago 25 days every year. And uh, he didn't accept a phone call. He didn't. Uh, he put a little mattress, took his mattress and put it on a, in a room in the church. And he fasted and prayed for 25 days. Every year, right in the church. And my, what a dimension of power he had in his life. Amen. It was, you know, it's all right, take the mattress in into the church not the best one it's not one of those beauty rests no you just take one of those little you know the army cot variety we we have those kind of mattresses in jerusalem you can come and sleep in the chapel anytime you want and uh, have the experience of the glory of god around the clock uh, hallelujah that dimension when i mentioned brother mats and Bose, I <clears throat> Another brother that's a lovely brother is Brother Shavda Mahesh, and uh, he, he's lovely. He's uh, originally from Nairobi, and he's coming more into being known in America these days, but <clears throat> he's had some very great uh, conferences this year down in Charlotte, he and his wife and others. But um, we were together in uh, Malaysia in June, in a meeting, and we've known him in Israel. He's come every year for the Feast of Tabernacles, I don't know, and probably since the beginning, at least 10 years or more that I've known him. But he does two 40-day fasts a year just to keep the keenness. You know, it takes uh, that which it takes to get it, it takes the same thing to keep it. Uh, you know, the... You, you move into it, but uh, to keep the keen edge, that cutting edge in the realm of the spirit, takes the same thing to keep it as it does to get it. And uh, he goes on to liquid fast, uh, meaning juices and 
little broth, whatever, you know, after a while. The first, sometimes when people start off the first four or five days, they drink every juice in sight. And, that, and people say, oh, well, that's not a fast. I said, well, leave them alone. After five or six days, they'll get sick and tired of every juice. And they'll try to find one they can manage. After a while, you know, you just, every, it all changes and you get into the mode of fasting and it's a, a real prayer and fasting unto God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, she caught a body and I. Halabari be under a bababandro. You know, Brother um, <coughs> Franklin Hall, he, he was the one that wrote the original book, The Fasting Prayer. And that's really. That's really what prayer is. I mean, that's what fasting is. It's another dimension of prayer. People say, how much should you pray when you're fasting? Don't worry. There are times you'll be praying all the day. Just keep going. Amen. Don't worry. <laughs> you don't have to get this limited You'll find you'll wake up praying. You'll go to bed praying. Amen. Your life will become a prayer. Hallelujah. In that fasting, it'll become a prayer. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. It'll happen with such great ease. You'll be amazed at the change. The thing that was exciting about him, now this all started with the mattress, Sister Carneal. The thing that was exciting, he was a short little preacher, and he traveled all over America. I think he started about 40, 1947, and he had an anointing. He not only preached on fasting, but people who had never fasted a meal. I mean, they were off and running to 40 days. I mean, they didn't work them, their way into it. You'd go into church after church. I knew in our own church. He came by, and, and people, you couldn't get to skip one meal. They were suddenly in the midst of their 40-day fast. <laughs> it, was, it was something. And God used him as a forerunner across America around 47 to get to bring people into fasting, and it was that fasting that birthed that great revival. And you know, the interesting thing about today is that God has moved on an evangelical, Bill Bright, to write a book on fasting. And the evangelical world that's never been interested in fasting if they didn't believe in speaking in tongues, fasting was even beyond speaking in tongues. They certainly didn't believe in fasting. And now God's moved on, Bill Bright, and he, a year or so ago, and he fasted and wrote a book on it, and uh, evangelicals across America are beginning to fast and pray. No wonder God's sending a move of his spirit hallelujah hallelujah that move of the spirit of god oh yes hallelujah god is doing it with such ease by his spirit hallelujah give me c minor Ooh. beyond the moon and stars you are, you are Beyond the moon and stars You are, you are Beyond the moon and stars You are, you are I want 
to consider you. I want to consider, to consider you. I want to consider, to consider you.
those things that are eternal, those things that are glorious, we want to consider them, O oh Lord. We want to consider you. Harabanda, rabababando. Haribiaranda, bababarandoro. Hayamaranda, ribiandanda, rababo. While we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And yea, thou art weighted down. Thou art weighted and encumbered with too many, many things of the natural. Thou art weighted down, yea, with too many natural considerations. For thou hast laid on thyself things that I have not laid upon thee. Thou hast taken them unto thyself, and yea, they have been weighed upon thee. But I would have thee so free, so free, so free, that thou could soar into realms beyond. Yea, that thou could see the revelations of my glory, that thou couldst know my power and my might. That thou couldst perceive, yea, in realms that thou hast never perceived before. Yea, I desire to open all of heaven, yea, that thou mayest walk in heavenly places with me, O Lord, saith the Lord. Yea, that thou mayest know those realms of glory, that thou mayest sit in them, walk in it, experience it day by day. Yea, be thou not encumbered, encumbered, encumbered with the things of the natural, the things that weigh thee down. But cast them off, cast them off, rid thyself of them, that thou mayest be free, yea, to soar into realms that I have prepared for thee, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of the things that we are that we have weighing us down are things that we have taken on ourselves. They have not been given to us by God, but we ourselves are weighing ourselves down with it. But God wants to free us. Oh yes, he does. Hallelujah. Uh, earlier this year, this past year I was in Jerusalem and brother uh, Pat Robertson was having a program for uh, televising up on the Mount of Olives and I was invited to be one of the people that was being interviewed on television. After the program that morning, I went up to one of the men that was in, uh, that was at that time, he was the, he was the uh, executive producer for the 700 Club. When I walked over to Norm, Norm said to me, your brother prophesied over me recently and God gave a word that he was going to free me from encumbrances. He says, I'm waiting for it to happen. I said, Norm, sometimes God wants us to help him. Amen. Those things that we can free ourselves from do. That which you're not able to free yourself from, he will do it for us. Amen. 
Hallelujah. But oftentimes our lives are encumbered with encumbrances that we ourselves have got ourselves all weighted down, cares, problems, situations, amen, that we could free ourselves from. When I said that to him, he began to laugh. Now this is what he told us later. He said, Sister Ruth, I went back to my room that day and he said, I was taking a shower and while I was taking a shower, he said, God spoke to me to start reading your book again and God told me to go on a 40-day fast. I don't know why this fasting keeps coming up, but God's obviously speaking. Never heard the word 40 so much as I've been hearing it today. He said, God told me to go on a 40-day fast. He began on this 40-day fast. I didn't know it. We were there at the 700 Club, I guess, in uh, September. Late September, he came up to me and told me this story. He said, it has been life-changing. He said, shortly after I came back, I discovered uh, that I was no longer the... Uh, executive producer for the 700 Club. He said, if I hadn't have already been fasting, I wouldn't have known how to handle it. We were with him the last night of his 40-day fast, and I laid my hands on him. My brother and I and Cindy Jacobs, we all ministered prophetically to him and were there as he finished up the 40-day fast. He said it had been the most life-changing experience. Uh, I just recently was with someone. I'm trying to remember who it was. His name came up. Uh, I, I think a relative of his. I'm trying to recall where I was. And uh, they said he had just, I don't know, just in the last couple of weeks, said he is doing praise and worship. He's... First of all, he's the worship leader in that big Presbyterian church down in, in Chesapeake, and they're coming on fire. He read the he read the the glory book and is bringing them into the glory, and everybody in the Presbyterian Spirit-filled church there are being uh, coming into the glory realm. And I understand Norm just uh, uh, has been started doing praise and worship seminars. Uh, amen. God's just got a whole new ministry for him. Uh, amen. Uh, from executive producer uh, to leading uh, the angels and the congregation together uh, in worship unto the King of Kings. Amen. Uh, he may be doing some other things in television. I don't know, but I'm just telling uh, that part. It started, started that day. He said, I was taking a shower and I had just been reading a couple of chapters of your book. And he said, suddenly God spoke to me and told me. But it began because he said, when is God going to remove the encumbrances? Well, God was going to do it pretty soon. I mean, he was just about ready to get rid of his great job. Amen. Probably one of the most sought after jobs in America. But there were also things God wanted him to get rid of. And when he set himself to fasting, hallelujah, he began. Sometimes uh, we don't know what's ahead, but the only way we can get ready for it is by a fast. Sometimes it's the good and sometimes it's the bad and sometimes it's the bad that turns out to be the good. Amen. Hallelujah. I said all that because I remembered when we were worshiping at St. Peter in Gali Kantu and we'd been there for almost 10 years, Sister Susan gave me a prophetic word. <coughs> and um, the word was that uh, uh, soon that something was going to happen in my life that would be devastating to me. But God said, it'll be of me. Well, I didn't know what was going to be devastating. I mean, that's a pretty strong word. And, uh, you know, we had all this group of young people living in Jerusalem. We had that responsibility. They were riding on buses. We didn't know 
We were blessed. We through the almost 25 years now, we never had anybody ever hurt uh, in any kind of situation there in the country. Uh, and but when you've got young people and you've got visitors and people coming through all the time in a country uh, that has a reputation for having problems, uh, uh, you know, we could have had most anything. Devastating sounded so strong, and I didn't know what to do. But I know the way to get ready for anything is to fast. Amen. Oh, yes. It prepares the vessel. Amen. Oh, yes. Uh, it prepares. It's the new wine skin. The new wine skin for the new wine. Hallelujah. It is that preparation that God begins to do within. And I began to uh, fast and pray <coughs> and uh I don't recall how long I fasted and prayed, but I prayed, but I know it was a little while. And uh, right in the midst of this, I got a message that the fathers at the church wanted to see me. And I had a feeling that this might have something to do with this word. And we were getting ready to have our conference. We were having a conference in the big conference center. And so I, I said... To the fathers, I sent a message to these Catholic fathers. I said, we are getting ready for our big conference. Would it be all right if I come and see you the day after the conference? They sent word back, yes. I thought, well, if this is part of the devastation, we will uh, get through the conference and have it afterward. Well, up to the conference the night last night in the up up in the church we were packed out. People from all over the world were there in the service, uh, dancing and rejoicing with us in the very place where Peter denied the Lord. Uh, we were having the privilege of affirming him, and uh, we had our conference. And I remember there were some senators there and some other wonderful people that were there, and we had about. Uh, I don't know, 900 Koreans that were with us uh, from all over Europe and from other places. We had a tremendous conference. And then the next morning, I kept my word and I went in to see the fathers. They were some new fathers. The old fathers that knew us had retired. And these were the new fathers in charge of the church. And they said... Some of the people, some of the fathers are afraid that you're becoming too entrenched here. We'd been there almost 10 years. We were getting mail from all over the world, being sent there to the church. I said, oh no, Father, we have been your guest. And any time you want us to leave, you just say the word and we will go. So I brought the subject up of leaving. They said, oh, no, no, we'll give you nine months to get ready to leave. You know, to find another place to worship. But I knew, I mean, I knew God had been speaking about change. When God's speaking about change, why do we hold on to the status quo? God's speaking about change and we go on a fast to hold on to what he's trying to change. And I just took a deep breath because we, we had the only place we knew to worship since we'd been in Jerusalem was St. Peter and Gallicantu. It was the finest church situation in the city. And we had been only blessed there. We had, uh, ha had, uh, had, it was a place of revelation and glory. We hadn't had any great financial pressures because we took an offering in every service and whatever offering came in, we gave it to the fathers. But no great pressures to produce financially. And uh, it had been a great blessing. Beautiful church with mosaics all around the walls. Visitors coming from all over the world. And I, all I prayed as I sat there, I said, Lord, don't let me cry. You know, this was home and this was the place of blessing and this was the place of the calling. And this was, uh, and Sister Susan and I were sitting there and I took a deep breath 
And I said, next Sunday night will be our last night in the church. Because if we were, God was speaking about change, don't try to hold on. I didn't want to hold on for another nine months and have the enemy come in and shake the relationship that had been a good relationship. I didn't want him to shake the relationship, so we ended up with a bad relationship with the fathers who had been so wonderful. They said, oh, no, no, you don't need to move out so quickly. I said, no, thank you. We have only been blessed here, but Sunday night we'll have meetings this weekend. We'll announce to the people that we'll be praying at our house. We didn't have any other place other than our house that we were renting. And uh, we went ho- I went home and cried. Amen. I wasn't as spiritual then as I am now. I pr- I'd have cried less now. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Went home and cried and told Sister Irene and a couple of our top people in our ministry, Sister Susan knew and Sister Irene, Sister Janet, the four of us knew. We didn't tell anybody else. We didn't want a pity party. We didn't want to be melodramatic. Uh, If God had given us this church to worship in when we first worshiped in, we didn't know if we'd be there three nights, three weeks, three months, uh, and here almost ten years we worshiped in that church. uh, And uh, and I didn't want to go out being melodramatic. uh, And the fathers have put us out and all the rest. Oh, no. Uh, We just went to church Friday night, Saturday night, uh, on Sunday night again. Now my voice still was a little little shaky over all this. uh, And I didn't want to announce it early in the service. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know if I might shed a tear or two. So I waited two minutes to nine o'clock. And I took a deep breath. Amen. And I said, next Friday night we'll be meeting at Halcyon House next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and that's the way we left the church. But I couldn't have made it if I hadn't have been fasting. Couldn't have made it. There's something about fasting that puts steel in the soul. It puts strength within you. Amen. Yes, it did. I remember once... uh, uh, this is along the physical side, but I we arrived in uh, India, and it was so hot, I thought to myself, I know better than to accept an invitation to come to India in May. What was I thinking about? When I accepted this invitation to come, it was so hot, 135 degrees in the shade, and I arrived... And I knew the only way I was going to make it was by fasting, because fasting also thins the blood. Yes, it does. When you're fasting, you'll get a little cooler. Sometimes it's a little harder to fast in the winter time than uh, it's always easier in the summer time. But I, I started fasting, and I started drinking a lot. You know, when you fast, you automatically drink more liquid and I began giving the other folks more liquid Uh, they were eating but uh, I was giving them more liquid Uh, and the whole time I was in India I fasted and not only was it physically a blessing to me but it was spiritually a, a blessing to the congregation oh yes when I got word that my brother had passed away I didn't know anything to do but to fast. I fasted from that moment on, drank a little coffee on the plane, I think, came to the funeral and fasted the whole... I wouldn't have made it. I would not have made it if I had not been fasting. You know, sometimes people think that we only need to fast before things. Sometimes we need to fast during Amen. Doing through the midst of situations, we sometimes likewise need to be fasting. There's a strength 
Oh, yes, physically you might feel a little, uh, uh, you know, a little less strong, but there is a strength that comes from within. Hallelujah. This tremendous chapter from Isaiah 58. Now, I didn't plan to preach on fasting. I keep opening my Bible to other greater subjects. Hallelujah. But I'm going to turn to Isaiah 58, this great chapter on fasting. Hallelujah. Any one of these promises in this chapter is enough reason to want to fast. I don't know. There are more than a dozen, I'm sure, promises that any one of those would be like a ruby, a sapphire, an emerald, a diamond, a pearl, a jewel for which one should want to fast. Amen. Oh, yes, any one of them. And when you put them all together, you get a diadem. <laughs> Hallelujah of jewels. Just starting with verse 6, is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, uh, to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house uh, and when thou seest the naked that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Let me just, uh, I, I'm not going to comment on every verse as we go through. All of them are great. But one of the things that fasting does is you see yourself in a way that we need to. We don't need to be, uh, we don't need to live in condemnation. But things that we don't realize that need changing suddenly uh, while we're fasting, we see ourselves and God begins to help us, uh, amen, to deal with those things. Verse 8, then, <laughs> this is after the fast, uh, then shalt thy light break forth uh, as the morning. Oh, yes, a uh, uh, breaking forth of light as uh, the sun that riseth in the morning. Uh, and thy health shall spring forth speedily. Uh, amen. Uh, hallelujah. Many a time a person that's sick, they need to fast. Yes, they need to fast. Sister Che Dr. Cho's mother-in-law was a tremendous woman on fasting. She uh, had aspects of fasting I'd never heard anybody speak about. In our family, mother had fasted two days a week most of her life. And then there was a period of time that God asked her to go. She started on a, a one meal a day in which she ate one meal a day in which... Usually, uh, if it was some family affair, she would wait and try to eat when we all ate together. You know, a birthday or an anniversary or something particular. But she got to the place that she was eating breakfast because the nights were long and she'd wake up hungry. And she made sure that even if there were telephone calls and other interruptions, that she didn't eat longer than within an hour period. You know, because you can take one meal and if you've got a lot of interruptions, stretch it out. She was, she was uh, uh, correct in her... She thought perhaps that she would fast, you know, uh, uh, one meal a day for a few weeks. The end of the few weeks, God wouldn't release her. The end of the month, God didn't release her. The end of six months, the end of the year, God didn't release her. I'm not sure. She went seven or eight years in which she ate only one meal a day. I believe God moved on her to do it to help bring in this last day revival. Uh, God moves on people to do it. Now, we have been blessed to have a family that has known the fasting life. We have been very blessed to know this. Sister Che, uh, a great, I would say, one of the great people of all times, uh, she not only, I mentioned to you that she had prayed all night, every night for 10 years. 
and saw the church go from just a handful, five people, to over 100,000. But also, she was great on fasting. And uh, when she would teach on fasting, she'd ha get you in line. I remember in Jerusalem, we had about 1,000 people in line this night. And I mean business people and other people, and some just gotten saved, and some uh, hadn't been, you know, saved too long, and some filled with the Spirit, and they'd come by. Now, instead of getting prayed for, you'd go by, and she, she'd touch you with her hand, but she'd, uh, she'd say, 21, 15, 40, 7. And everybody, and they did it. I'm saying these little... Uh, yeah, over in Korea, if hallelujah, mama gave you a word, 21, and you'd never had a, you know, you couldn't fast hardly 21 minutes. You were off and going. I, I, I was trying to figure out, I didn't want to say 21 hours. We had a brother in our ministry. He'd say, George, how long have you been fasting? Seven Seven days, Brother George? Seven hours. He fasted by the... He had a hard time getting a going. Sister Che would just point. I remember that night. She gave everybody a number except me. She loved me so much and loved to feed me. I think she... She would, when I was in Korea, she'd take those little delicate, you know, the Koreans have those real fine points. They m look more like crochet needles than they look like uh, uh, chopsticks, and they're so fine and delicate and metal, and she'd take those and she'd feed me these choice delicacies. And her people said, we have seen her with thousands of people. She's never, ever fed anybody but you. Well, they, they were just amazed. They had never, never seen her feed anybody, but she loved to feed me. And I think that was the problem. That day, she gave everybody a number except me. I probably got, uh, I was being, being delivered. She'd probably looked at me and said 100. But um, anyway, I was, but she... She had such insight. Now, here's what happened. She was called by a family once whose baby was dying in the hospital. And she said, tell them to have the baby fast for 24 hours and it'll be healed. So the family went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, the baby's dying anyway won't hurt the baby to fast for 24 hours, dying anyway. After 24 hours, the baby was healed. You know, James says, if any man's afflicted, let him pray. There is something about being sick and fasting for your health will spring forth speedily. They called her from J Japan one time and they said that uh, this man had a chicken farm and all of the chicken had, chicken had gotten some disease and all the chickens were dying. And she said, you tell them to have the chickens fast. A couple of days. I forget. I don't remember if it was two or three days that she had the chickens fast and they were all healed and not one of them died oh yes <laughs> hallelujah she did that oh yes if the person that was sick the person that was in need she said let them fast she had she had gotten a hold of this fasting message and it's powerful now Sometimes I've heard people say, well, I don't feel led to fast. Fasting in the book of Matthew is dealt with in the exact same way as giving and praying. Giving and praying and fasting 
are all three dealt with in the exact same way. Don't do it to be seen of men. Amen. But there are times in giving and in praying we do it because we know we need to. That we don't have to be felt let, we don't have to feel led to. We just pray and give. And then there are other times, special times, you feel led to do extra in praying and in giving, and the same with fasting. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are times you just fast because it's part of your spirituality and part of your acceptable offering unto the Lord. And then there are other times it might be a particular time in which you feel some people say well if if, if uh, you're having a hard time you didn't feel led to it wouldn't have got that's nonsense have you ever had a hard time praying and you knew you should be praying have you ever had a hard time giving and you knew you should be giving whatever applies to giving and praying applies to fasting anytime you have a question move it back in what about if it were giving what about if it were praying? If I had a hard time, would I say it wasn't of God? No, you just say your flesh was a little more resistant at that particular time. Amen? Oh, yes, yeah, sometimes our flesh. Uh, sometimes we feel the pressures. Now, last night in the service, I mean, that song service was one of the worst I've ever been in. And our sister who is a tremendous song leader. She was having the most difficulty trying to get the rhythm. But you know why? She was leaving today to go to North Dakota to help bring these churches into praise and worship. And the devil was trying to fight her before she went make her think if she was having such a hard time to bring people that know how to come into praise and worship in what business did she have to go off to North, North Dakota where they didn't know how to do it to, to try to bring them in the pressure was on her you understand the attack was against her she was having a hard time Amen. She was having difficulty somehow the rhythm somehow whatever Amen hey, hey, hey. But it was the pressure. Sometimes the fact that you are having difficulty doesn't mean to stop. It's even more reason to press through because the enemy knows the victory that you're going to have. He foresees it more than you foresee it. Amen. And he's trying to block it because he doesn't want you. Now, I have, I've had times that I was trying to get into a really good fast, and I'd make it to midnight. <laughs> Two in the morning. Eat. Start again the next morning. Make it to midnight. Two o'clock in the morning. Had a hard time to get going. But if you can get going past the third day, from four on is usually sailing. Amen. Just usually sailing. Amen. Sometimes, though, I, I've had times that I've had times in which it was so easy, and times in which it was so hard. And God allows us to go through both situations, uh, times in which suddenly you leave a service and you're so anointed and you just push back your, uh, your food and you don't want it. Uh, amen. I, I, I find it the easiest when I go to big events to fast. Because I want to be busy talking to people about God. And when I, the bigger the event, I usually don't eat. Because I don't want to be concerned uh, although they usually have the big you know the nicest the specialties and all of the things you would like to eat uh, but in those occasions I want to give myself 
to the ministry under the people and I'll usually just pick up a drink of juice and walk around with a, a glass of something in my hand and not be worried about trying to get something to eat uh, and God honors the fasting. There is something about a lifestyle of fasting. This is what Paul said. He said in fastings oft, often, often, Amen. It came to the place it was a lifestyle with him. It wasn't counting the days. Now, if God's told you 21-day fast, then count them. Amen. Count the days to make sure you make do a 21-day fast. But if you're just uh, fasting unto God, you say, well, what about if I fail? Well, you know, in the old days, if we fail, we so broke my fast. So we go out and we forget about it. No. If you ate something, forgot, slipped, it left your memory, you tasted while you were cooking. I've cooked for fam our family when I was on a 30-day fast, never tasted a thing, never wanted to taste a thing. God's helped me to do that lots of times. God will help you in that area of fasting. He'll help you. Amen. Hallelujah. He doesn't want it to be a chore. That's why he says anoint your face. Don't look like you're... Don't appear to men. Does that mean not to tell anybody? No. It just means don't look haggard. Yes, don't look that way. Amen. Get up in the morning. Wash your face. Put on your perfume. Dress up. Don't just uh, laze around because you're fasting. Don't have any energy. Uh, I mean, you know, if you act like you don't have any energy, by the end of the day, you won't have a speck. You get up in the morning and anoint your face and get up and get going. Uh, hallelujah. You'll find yourself uh, with strength and you'll go from strength to strength, anointing uh, to anointing. You'll find yourself. Uh, but the thing is this. You will have a sensitivity to the realm of the Spirit. And that's, I would say, the great thing that comes from fasting uh, is your sensitivity to the spiritual realm. <coughs> it's easier to see in the spirit when you're fasting. It's easier to hear the voice of God when you're fasting. It's easier to have visions and dreams and revelations when you're fasting. It's easier to know the will of God when you're fasting. I don't know, there's an ease the natural man decreases and the spiritual man increases. I must decrease, but he must increase. And we lay down the natural in order to take on the eternal. We lay down the temporal in order to take on that which is eternal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Now, if you don't want to listen to this for yourself, get, a, get, get it a study material for somebody else. Oh, yes. Don't stop listening. Listen, because you can say, well, I, I, I want to teach this course. Oh, hallelujah. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, verse 8. Thine health shall spring forth speedily. Thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy rear guard. Thou sh Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. He's just so close when you're fasting. I mean, you don't have to call loud. You just say, it's Jesus. And he hears. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. Thou take away from the, thee, from the midst of thee, the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity. Thy draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul. 
Then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday sun. Listen, if your light begins to rise in obscurity, you say, I'm an unknown, you won't remain one. Amen. Hallelujah. People say God's going to use the nobodies in the last day. Listen, when God uses you, you can't remain a nobody. Oh, no, the very anointing, the very blessing of God, the very, the very fact that his glory is being revealed through you will make you known for his name's sake and not for your own. Your light will rise in obscurity and the very darkest moment you ever have will be as the noonday. Oh, yes, it will. Hallelujah, noonday, there might be an overcast day at some point, uh, but other than a little overcast, uh, noonday is always bright, always bright you'll be, you'll have that brightness that will break forth in your life, uh, it'll be in your heart, it'll be in your spirit, it'll shine forth uh, on your countenance, it will be visible, and the Lord, verse 11, shall guide thee continually. Hallelujah. You say, I don't know what God wants. I need the Lord to guide me fast. And you'll move into a way in which you know the continual leading and guiding of the Lord. You will know that. Hallelujah. The Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought when there is a famine and drought round about uh, your soul will always be satisfied i can't remember the time that i was last spiritually frustrated thank god i can't remember it's been so long ago when I was frustrated spiritually. No. He satisfies the soul. Oh yes. There is a satisfying of the soul in drought. Everybody else might be in drought. But your soul will be watered. You will be as the watered garden whose waters fail not, which is one of the next verses. Uh, hallelujah. Notice this. The next part of that verse. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul and draw it. Make that thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not, you will be that. You will be that. Amen. You will become the watered garden. You will become the, the spring of water. You will be the one who has waters that do not fail. Oh, yes, you will be that. Hallelujah. Verse 12. And they that shall be of thee shall build thee always places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Part of verse 12 became the theme for the president's inaugural speech. I heard him speak again at the National Prayer Breakfast. He quoted that verse again. Oh, the repairer of the breach. Hallelujah, you'll be one. Hallelujah, that is able to build up the foundations of many generations uh, 
this nation built on the foundation of faith people that wanted religious freedom hallelujah that came from different nations to found this country those foundations are going to be built up hallelujah and who's going to build them up the fasters amen oh yes the fasters those that are willing to fast will become the ones that build up the foundations of many gen what does it mean you'll be the answer to many generations prayers They've prayed, they've gone on. But those prayers are bottled up in the heavenlies and those very prayers will be answered in you. My parents' prayers, my grandparents' prayers, my great-grandparents' prayers, our forefathers. I'm blessed to be from the line of Jonathan Edwards, that great New England evangelist and revivalist. But I can be the answer to his prayers and those of his generations. Those of us that are willing to fast, this is a job description, folks. Uh, hallelujah. If you're willing, uh, if you're willing to fast and pray, uh, God said uh, you'll be able to raise up the foundations, build them up of many generations. Uh, you'll be able to be one uh, that is the repairer of the breach. Uh, and you'll be able to do that next thing, which is be the restorer of paths to dwell in. Everyone is distressed by certain events that are not only happening in America, but around the world, and everybody wants paths that we can dwell in, safety and security. It's not going to come except through people that are willing to pray and to fast. Hallelujah. It's God's time to bless America from sea to shining sea. And as goes America, so will go the rest of the world. I was reading this morning, and I wish I had it with me, George Washington's vision. When he saw, the, when the angel came to him and told him to listen and learn, and spoke to him concerning this nation up till the end of this century. Yes, up to the end of the century he was spoken to by God concerning it. God raising us up as the restorer of paths to dwell in. You say, but I'm just an ordinary housewife. I'm an ordinary preacher. I'm an or No, when you begin to fast and pray, hallelujah, you become extraordinary. That little Korean mama didn't get saved till she was 40 years old over in Seoul, Korea. Went to Bible school, saw that lean young man about 17 in the same Bible school. Had a nice daughter. She thought, oh, he would be... I wouldn't mind having him for my son-in-law. She began to pray. That's the way Dr. Cho became her son-in-law, just a young novice in the things of God. But she began to be a person of prayer and fasting. And together they saw that church go from five people in the tent to over... When, uh, when I first met her, there was more than 100,000 people in the church. Today, I don't know, I think there are somewhere between 750,000 and a million people in one church in Seoul, Korea. Why? Because not only did she fast, but she began to teach others how to be those that fast and pray. And you know, they not only reached Korea... 
But then they began to get a missionary heart to reach the world. And there are, I don't know about today, but when I first met Sister Che, they had sent their first Korean missionaries to Europe. And in three years, they raised up 18 churches in Europe alone. Hallelujah. These young people, hallelujah. you know what Dr. Che said? Dr. Cho said, I don't know if you've heard this story about Japan, one of the hardest countries in the world. He's done all of his missionary work by women. I mean, after it gets to be 500, he sends a man. When it's nothing, he sends a woman. She went and she rented a little place didn't speak Japanese, little Korean woman that knew how to fast and pray, knew the Bible a little bit, and that's all. She closed herself in and fasted 21 days. The neighbors began to come in and knock on the door, checking to make sure she was okay. Oh, she said, I'm fasting and praying for revival to come to Japan. By the end of her 21-day fast, she had her first little nucleus to start the church. How did they come? They all came knocking on the door to see if she was okay because she wasn't coming out. She wasn't doing the normal things. Amen. From there they went, uh, and God raised up a church of 500 in Japan. That's like 5,000. You know, that's a big Japan to have a church of 500. And then Brother chosen someone else of all over the world they go in and start by prayer and fasting the restorer of paths to dwell in the repairer of the breach the the one that raises up many foundations hallelujah and if thou turn away thy foot verse 13 from the sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable. And shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. Oh yes, you'll find delight in him. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. And feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. You'll move into a delight in God. You'll find yourself riding the high places of the earth. Why? He says, I will cause it to happen. I will cause it. I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth. And I will feed you. You say, oh, I thought I was fasting. Oh, we're fasting McDonald's, but we're feeding on heaven. Oh, yes, well, we're fasting the Burger King, but we're feeding on heaven. <laughs> yes, we're fasting Wendy's, but we're feeding at the, on the table of the Lord. Yes, we're fa You understand what I'm saying? You are feeding when you're fasting, you're just feeding on the table of the Lord. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. That's the, that's the signature on the contract. The mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And I said to the Lord once, why is it that you say you'll feed us with the heritage of Jacob? Why isn't it Abraham? Why isn't it Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Why is it Jacob? <coughs> and I discovered that he, he promised Abraham the land. With the next generation, he increased the promise. To Isaac he promised the land and the inhabitants thereof. With the next generation he increased it. There's an increase with every generation. I don't want just what God promised Grandma. Oh no. 
and neither do I want just what he promised mama. No, no. There's an increase in the promise to every generation. And it was promised. And there's this little word in Hebrew that's spoken in, in uh, concerning Jacob's promise. And in King James it just says, And thou shalt spread abroad to the north, the south, the east, and the west. Uh, this little word, Ufaratsta, is a word that every child knows. There's a little song, a nursery song that goes, Ufaratsta, Ufaratsta, Yama Vakedma, Tsafona Vanegba, Ufaratsta, and it goes on, Ufaratsta. Thou shalt burst thy boundaries, thou shalt break forth. <laughs> Hallelujah, you'll go beyond the the borders. You'll go beyond the boundaries uh, to the north, the south, the east, and the west. Uh, you'll break forth on the right hand. You'll break forth on the left. You'll break forth before and behind. Uh, amen. Fasting brings you into an inheritance without limitation, without limitation borders not just the land and the inhabitants of the land but you're going to have you're going to break forth beyond those borders to the north the south the east and the west you're going to know an inheritance in God without limitation hallelujah when we fast we take the limitations off of our thinking we take the limitations off of our own understanding. We take the limitations off uh, of our ability to move in the things of the Spirit of God. We take those limitations off even in the fasting and we are fed with the inheritance of Jacob. <laughs> For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it <laughs> hallelujah the disciples said why is it that John's disciples fasted and yours don't Jesus said the bridegroom is with them but when the bridegroom is taken away they will fast amen they will hallelujah that fasting shows that we want the bridegroom to come back. <laughs> it's our longing for him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Just determine that you're going to do a little more fasting than you've been doing, and God will lead you into a fasting life. But it's life-changing, and it changes the pattern of history. For generations. Oh yes it does. They say of the Wesley brothers. That if it hadn't been for Charles. And John Wesley. That England would have had. A civil war just like France did. But the two of them. And their ministry. Kept England from having civil war. Oh, yes. Two people and their ministry. Amen. Causing a whole nation to have a different history than they would have had if they had not been on the scene. I heard, I had heard a British consular official say that that wasn't even born again. He was speaking on, on uh, history of England in regards to uh, Israel. And he said if it hadn't been the Wesley brothers uh, that England would have had a civil war just like France did. But it was there. Uh, he was talking about because God used the Wesley brothers to put the eyes of the believers on Jerusalem. And that's when the first British travelers came to live in the Holy Land was as a result of the revival of the Wesley brothers as well. Oh yes, God changing the course 
because we want to be a people, hallelujah, that repair the breach and raise up the foundations of many generations and are the restorer of paths to dwell in. Oh, hallelujah. One of the little ladies that's been attending our meetings, I haven't gotten to know her really well, but she and her hus husband and their brother have a, a little have a business and I asked her to come and look at the landscaping at my brother's house. She came this morning early. I was amazed by her story. She's been coming to camp for years. I've just been seeing her sort of in, in the back. She said at first she would just slip in after waitressing. She'd get in late at night if she could get in, in for, even in for a few minutes. But to hear how attending this ministry had brought their whole family into different paths than they ever would have been in. What a blessing. What a blessing to know that God can use you to bring people into new pathways, pathways that they're able to live in. Paths before in which they wanted to die every day of their life. Paths before in which they didn't think they would ever make it another day. Paths in which everybody before that they knew had the same lifestyle, but now through God has changed them. Now change the brother, beginning to work on the husband, uh, the whole family coming into different uh, pathways. It's wonderful. Hallelujah. Doesn't it make it worthwhile to skip a meal? Doesn't it make it worthwhile? Hallelujah. Now, I didn't say any of that to keep any of you from eating lunch today. Uh, you can go and eat lunch without one feeling of guilt. Don't worry, after camp, God might just launch you into a good 40 day. So enjoy the blessing of God. And our Heavenly Father, I just decree it. I decree that you'll bring us forth to be a people that have a fasting lifestyle. That as the Apostle Paul said in fastings oft, uh, that it shall not be a struggle nor a striving uh, but, Lord, bring the ease into our life, even as we know the ease that comes to your glory. I believe you, Lord, to use us to be those that help bring in this last day revival and to repair the breach in our nation and raise up the foundations of our forefathers even here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Those that want to come to the front for a few minutes, feel free if you want to go on to the lunch table. Feel free. Three o'clock this afternoon, we're going to have a great service. <laughs>
give myself to Thee.
Oh, oh, oh. 
upon the high places. Oh, I shall ride upon the high places. Oh, I shall ride upon. you're busy thinking on the sermon don't think on it get your little thought your thinker don't let your thinker think some of us don't have too much problem we don't have the thinker to think but those of you that have got good thinkers to think with don't let them overthink be motivated from within. From within. Amen. From within. Hallelujah. From within. Hallelujah. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. But I'll give you one added plus about these 40-day fast. This is the plus one. You can look in a congregation and look on somebody's face and tell. You can pick out the ones that have fasted 40 days by their countenance. He puts your diploma on your face. Oh, yes, he does. It doesn't hang on the wall. He puts it right on your face. Yes, he does. Hallelujah. Ho, ho, ho. Now, one thing I neglected to say, and that is this. You have to go to church while you're fasting. You need the anointing. You need to dance. I've gone to church when I was fasting. I could hardly hobble in. And you get in that anointing and you're dancing your way out. That strength that comes. Strength, strength, strength. Great strength that comes in the church service. It's not the time to stay home from church. People come to me in Jerusalem. They all want to go out in the wilderness and fast for 40 days like Jesus. I won't let them do it. Not if they have anything to do with me. I won't let them go out into the wilderness. Those Judean hills have been too many people killed in them. And uh, people get lost and get dehydrated and get all kinds of... It sounds romantic. But your Judean hill is right where you are. Amen. Amen. Right where you are. Amen. And uh, Jesus, Jesus was fasting and tempted of the enemy. And sometimes we don't know the temptations, but we have the word of God. Amen. You'll be, you'll go through testings while you're fasting, but resist with the word of God. Amen. Oh, 
world, but go to church. Go to church. You'll walk in and somebody will give a prophecy. Just what you need. A couple nights I was late for church a couple weeks ago, a week or so ago, when things were, a number of things were happening in our own lives. And uh, I walked in. I only got the last sentence of Sister Jane's prophecy. I don't know how great the first part was, but that last sentence was all I needed. I needed that last sentence, and when I walked in and got that sentence, I was free. Amen. Just free of all the problems and the cares. You need to come to the house of God while you're fasting. It's not the time to stay home and turn over and get some extra sleep. Yes. Do you do liquid fast? Do you do any liquid fast or do you just try water? Well, do the liquid fast. She's saying if, you're, if you've got some health problems, uh, you know, you don't need to do a pure water fast. There are many fasts in the scripture. Remember Daniel, uh, he ate no pleasant bread, pleasant, pleasant food. One, pre, one, one man, they tell this joke, he said, well, ever since I got married, I've been fasting. He ate no pleasant food. What he's saying, and listen, when we're sincere with God, we know when we're sacrificing. Sometimes people say, I remember one time God gave me a word for a very um, outstanding businessman in Hong Kong for him to fast every breakfast. Fast breakfast every morning for six months and to pray during that time. Now, for him, for him, breakfast was so important. He'd go to the office and make these million-dollar decisions, and it was a great sacrifice. In six months, he was a totally new man. He ended up uh, stepping into areas of ministry instead of just business, and his life has been totally different. Uh, and it came from that. Now, you don't like breakfast, so you know you don't. So, so that's not fasting for you. But for somebody else, fasting breakfast every day for a period of time would be a great fast. Amen? We all know when we're denying flesh. Amen? Amen. And the thing that you do that's saying, all you're doing is saying no to self so that the spirit can ascend. And whatever that is, some people say, I remember once we were on a liquid fast, a long liquid fast, to Susan and I. And um, some people were in the house and they, they were so critical of us. They said, you're not fasting if you're not just drinking water. No, God sees your heart. It's a heart intent. Amen. He sees the heart. Somebody says, well, can I drink milk when I'm fasting? I don't like milk, so it would be a you know, great <coughs> difficulty for me. You may want to drink milk, but as I said, you'll come to the place that certain things that you start off drinking, you won't want to drink. Sometimes I've seen people start off with a juice fast, and you think, wow, that looks like a banquet, pear juice and tomato juice and V8 juice and, and uh, juice juice and, you know, strawberry juice. Oh, you say, wow, that's a banquet. That's not a fast. They only start off like that because they're a little nervous about fasting. But after three or four days, I never say anything to people because after three or four days, first of all, they don't want it. They get bored with it. They don't want the sweetness. One sister Susan and I were on a long fast. It's amazing we didn't kill ourselves this particular time. We wanted something salty and pickly so much. It was about 60 days, and we stopped by a delicatessen, and I sent her in to get a quart of pickle juice out of the pickle barrel. And we drank that 
pickle juice. I was, and for the next week, we were so thirsty. I mean, you can imagine all that salt and all that. I mean, it's a wonder we hadn't killed ourselves. And then, of course, we were drinking a lot of water after that because of that pickle juice. Uh, you know, these are, are things that you learn. Uh, you know, there's no pickle juice mentioned in fasting in the Bible. But it's your heart. Your heart's desire toward God. Your heart's desire. You don't let anybody tell you you're not fasting if you stop and do something that maybe they wouldn't do. Amen. Uh, you fast unto God. You know what you're denying yourself. If you feel a little queasy and you've got a, a situation, all you need to do is just drink something and keep on. I've seen people that eat a little cracker and keep on. I'd rather them eat the cracker and keep on than forget about the fast totally. God sees the hunger in your heart for God. And it's like with praying. What do you do if the telephone rings and you're praying? If you're in the house all by yourself and you may have to get up and answer the phone. But you come back and keep on praying. Amen. That doesn't stop the prayer because you went and answered the telephone. You keep on praying. Whatever you would do in regards to prayer, just bring it over into fasting. Whatever you do in regards to giving, bring it over. If you tell somebody, you know, we don't flaunt the fact that we've given, but if we're teaching somebody, like this morning, I've told you some about my fasting, not for any other reason than to, as a teaching tool. It's a teaching tool. It's in the past. We've done it. It's, it's happened. It's not a matter of pride one way or the other because it takes the grace of God to do it. I remember one time I fasted 40 days. I've only fasted once 40 days on water. And I was fasting up in uh, Carros, France. And uh, it, I, that building was a stone building. We didn't have any heat. The wind was blowing. I was freezing. And uh, the first, the, the thing that I remember that came out of the fast, after 40 days, God said, leave France and go to Israel. And that was, and so Sister Susan and I took another sister, and the three of us left for Israel with $20 in our pocket and, and uh, lived in Israel five months. So each thing, oftentimes the new will be ushered in through fasting. God will do it just quickly for you, whereas it might have taken a longer period of time for you to be willing to do it. I have gone on a couple of fasts in which by the end of the fast, I didn't want color. It was like suddenly, and I wore white for some time. It was like while I was fasting, color just, the desire for color just left me. God didn't tell me to wear white, but it was like suddenly, you know, I just went out and bought some off-white and white dresses and wore that for a while. Color, just the desire left me while I was fasting. Uh, you'll find with you, each person will be different. God will work in your life in different ways than mine. God works in us all to bring us into the high place that he has. But uh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Anybody else have a question? Is that all okay?